Today we're doing lab number three, which is called Isolation and Function of Mitochondria. The technique is very similar to what was done in last week's lab called Isolation and Function of Chloroplast. Uh, the difference this time is that we're using animal cells, and specifically we're using liver cells. We use liver because liver is a very metabolically active organ, so it contains many mitochondria per cell. Mammalian liver cells, for example, generally contained, contain between 500 to 1,000 mitochondria per cell, so it's a good source of mitochondria. The first part of the lab, uh, the purpose is to um, isolate the mitochondria from the liver cells using cellular fractionation, which is the same technique that was completed last lab. Um, and then in the second part, your, the idea is to see if the mitochondria are um, functioning, specifically by looking at one step of the TCA cycle, which is the oxidation of succinate to fumarate using succinate dehydrogenase enzyme. The first part, I won't uh, video the actual technique. I will post pictures in the lab document itself, but I won't show you the technique uh, via video because it's incredibly similar to last week's lab. So you saw last week, so it's pretty well the same. You have to make a homogenate of the liver uh, and then send it through a couple series of centrifugation. The difference this time, however, when you uh, read over your lab document is that we use higher, ma uh, not magnification, we use higher centrifugation speeds to get out the mitochondria. And that's because the mitochondria are so tiny, they're so much smaller than the chloroplasts in the last lab, that in order for them to be um, pulled out of the suspension and down into a pellet, uh, you need a much higher speed in order to do that. So these are things that you should be uh, aware of. The other thing with this lab is that in the first part when we um, use cellular fractionation to uh, release the mitochondria, uh, you'll notice that there were two buffers that were used. The first buffer is called a homogenizing buffer and it contains uh, EDTA. EDTA chelates calcium ions to it. And that's important for you to know because um, when you break open the cells, uh, not only are you going to uh, release the mitochondria, but also, there are other organelles that are released, and one of them that is of interest is called lysosomes. And lysosomes contain an enzyme that are used to break down old red blood cells and other things, but that particular enzyme, if it's uh, active, it will also destroy the mitochondria. So to prevent that, we use the EDTA in the buffer, because lysosomes need calcium to work. So if we use EDTA, the EDTA chelates calcium to it. In other words, it takes the calcium away so that the lysozymes cannot work. So that's uh, one way we're gonna prevent the lysozyme enzyme from destroying the mitochondria. The other step that's done, or the other thing that's done to slow down the action of the mitochondria is to keep everything ice cold, or, okay. Uh, sorry, not to slow down the action of the mitochondria, but to slow down the action of the uh, lysozyme enzymes, is that we will keep everything ice cold until we want uh, things to be uh, functioning properly. So these are two things to prevent the lysozymes from working, using the homogenizing buffer with EDTA and keeping things ice cold until we need it, uh, the, any enzymes in the whole solution, specifically in this case, succinate dehydrogenase to work properly. Okay, so I'm now back in the lab. I was in my office previously, by the way, I didn't mention that, but uh, I'm in the lab again. So I've extracted the, uh, de uh, the mitochondria from the uh, liver cells. And so here's my mitochondrial suspension that I, uh, I've um, obtained through differential centrifugation. And um, what I've done already is set up some test tubes with everything in, it, in them that it asks you to in the lab document, except the mitochondrial uh, suspensions, because they go in one by one, and then we read um, 
the readings on the spec machine with them. So the first tube here on your left is the reagent blank. The next one to that is the succinate and sodium azide solution. The one next to that is the sodium azide only solution. The next one is succinate only solution. And the last one on the end is the boiled solution. So it's boiled mitochondria, but it also contains succinate and sodium azide. Um, so we're going to use spectrophotometry to determine whether or not the mitochondria are functioning, specifically if they are able to undertake the uh, oxidation of succinate to fumarate using succinate dehydrogenase enzyme. Uh, there's a PowerPoint presentation associated with this lab that explains how that works and how the use of the redox dye will enable you to determine whether or not that oxidation is of succinate to, to fumarate by succinate dehydrogenase enzyme is functioning. So you need to um, go through the PowerPoint presentation as well as you go through this particular lab exercise. So what I'm going to do now is add the mitochondrial solution to each of the tubes and start taking the readings. So great back. So I'm just going to show you um, one example of pouring in 0.5 mils of um, mitochondrial suspension. So this one is going into the reagent blank the one that's marked reagent blank. <laughs> so you just, uh, I've measured out 0.5 mils with a one mil graduated pipette, and I just pour it in. And then all I'll do is I'll add some parafilm to the top, mix it up, then I'm gonna pour it into a spec tube, like so. A spec tube like this, smaller. And then I'll, I'll show you the readings for the reagent blank, so, okay. Okay, so I'm gonna put the reagent blank in the spec machine and zero it so that it's zeroing, zeroing out everything in that solution so that in the other uh, spec tubes, it's only gonna read the absorbance of the re, uh, redox dye because that's the difference. Uh, this has everything except the redox dye. So you want the machine to read the absorbance of the redox dye in the other samples. So that's how you do that. You zero the reagent blank in between samples. Okay, so now it's zeroed and I'll get the next one set. Okay, so I just put in the, I just put in the sample that contains succinate sodium azide and uh, the mitochondrial solution, of course. So I'll get its reading. Um, then I'll do the next one, the next one, the next one. And then every three minutes for 21 minutes, I'll take readings of each of them. Uh, I, won't, um, I won't show you all of them. I'll just have the results in the table in the lab manual. Okay, so record this one now. Ah, it keeps going down. Okay. And here's the initial reading for the solution that contains uh, sodium azide only and mitochondrial solution. So I'll get its initial reading once it uh, stays itself there. Okay, this is the initial reading of the solution that contains succinate only, no sodium azide. Uh, it does contain mitochondrial solution, obviously. So uh, I'll get its initial reading for you. And finally, here's the initial reading of the boiled mitochondrial solution that contains succinate and sodium azide. Uh, I'll get its initial reading. And then for the next 21, or well, yeah, 21 minutes, I'll take readings every three minutes of each of the two, of each of the solutions. Uh, the absorbance of the redox dye in each one of them, and I'll uh, have that in the lab document for you for your results section. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this little video. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask uh, the lab staff for help.